So now I'm in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 19, verse number 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. This is Elijah, the great prophet, the man of God, the preaching machine. Now he's asking God to let him die. And he said, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and he laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant and thrown down thine altars and slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand up in the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire was still, after the fire... There was a still, small voice. I want to use these scriptures in its context, but maybe in a way that you're not basically familiar with the, in the traditional interpretation of what I'm going to deal with. According to verse number 8, Elijah had found himself at Mount Horeb while fleeing from the death threats of a whore named Jezebel. You've got to remember, just one chapter before, he was the one that stood on Mount Carmel, prayed 66 words, and fire fell from heaven and licked up the water, the altar, and the sacrifice. He was the one that took 400 false prophets and 450 false preachers out of Jezebel's college and stoned 850 false prophets. Mr. Roloff called that a non-profit organization. <laughs> so this guy has just experienced tremendous victory. This guy's on a mountaintop. He's the preacher man of the hour. Everybody's coming to hear and listen and get acquainted with this man named Elijah. But Jezebel sent word and said, by this time tomorrow, you're going to die. You've done messed up. And every church has a Jezebel. It, it takes a while to find them, but there's one in every church. And when I find them, I preach them till they're out of here because I ain't letting no Jezebel tell this church all the pieces. I'll tell you that right now. And I'm not afraid of them either, by the way. Most scholars believe this. Now, here's where I'm going to get my text. Most scholars believe that Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb is the same mountain. Because the mountain, the definition means a glowing fire. This, that means this is the same mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Now, many years later, Elijah is on top of this same, same mountain. It was called the glowing fire because Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai is a volcano. This is why you remember when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments from God, when the people saw the fire and saw the smoke, it scared them. And they said to Moses, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to God and we'll talk to you. The fire and the smoke they saw was the volcano being activated. You see, volcanoes are an eruption from within. It's, it, it builds up so much pressure that the earth has to crack and the pressure from within explodes into the air as well as upon the earth. Out of all the places he could have gone, why did Elijah go to Mount Horeb? How can you come off a mountaintop experience being in the very presence of God in the next chapter asking God to let you die? And he goes to a mountain where the earth cracks open and there's earthquakes and all this pressure from within blows out. It's because God in the Old Testament was illustrating something to us. No matter how godly you are, how many mountaintop experiences you have, and how many people love you, 
There are going to be times when things build up inside of all of us. I've heard this terminology more in the last six months than I have in a long time. Not only from my own congregation, but from friends and connections around the country. And I'm preaching on this subject, I feel like I'm about to explode. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, I just feel like there's so much pressure in me that I'm about to crack. Elijah was at the point where he felt like all the problems and the pressures of life had made him feel like he was about to burst from the inside out. And if you have never been there in life, enjoy it because you will get there before life is over. You see, if the devil can't get you to bow out, break out, burn out, bail out, back out, bounce out, or bust out, he'll just try to get you to blow out. So what the devil does is he accumulates problems in all different areas of our life. And one of them at a time is not really all that dangerous to us spiritually. But he affects so many areas of our life every day trying to get us to just blow up from within that we get so much on us and we put them all in one mountain and before we know it, we're depressed before we ever get out of bed. We're defeated before we ever get out of bed because we haven't come to the mature point where we take one problem at a time. The old song used to say, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. There's a lot of reality to that. And I tell my wife all the time, I refuse to worry about things I cannot change. I'm not sitting around chewing Rolaids that big around and sucking Maylocks over something that I don't have any power or authority to change. But I do know the devil is after you, and he's after me. And I'm more of an upbeat, positive, wide-open preacher. But every once in a while, we've got to come down to common sense. Some of us are going to face some problems this year that we have never faced before. And it's not going to be an easy thing to get through. Some of you are going to lose your jobs. Some of you will lose your health. You don't even know it. But this is the last year you will ever live upon the face of this earth. Some of you may bury a child. Some of you may get a terminal sickness that's long and rough and painful. Some of you, your family may be shattered. You may be divorced by the end of this year. Some of you will face heartaches you've never dreamed of. We have had people in this congregation go through things that if I said them in particular from this pulpit, you would cry the rest of the day for them. Because the devil knows how to put so much on us that we just blow out. And we all have that tendency. This world's a pressure cooker. Everything's under pressure. Everything's wide open. Everybody's in a bad mood. I remember when just mother-in-laws were in bad moods. Now it's everybody. And if you don't think this world's not a pressure cooker in a bad mood, just don't take off right away when the light turns green. They'll cuss you. They'll bump the back of your bumper, man. Because that's the way the world is set up. And any little thing throws people off because they're on the edge. So something that's mild, that shouldn't even matter to anything, is just enough to make us blow up. Have you ever been around somebody or even yourself, some little something happened and you just blew up and you thought, why did I do that? That is so minor and simple. It's because we allow the devil to build up so much stuff inside us that we literally feel sometimes like we're going to explode. And some of us will be there. And some of us have been there. So there's some danger points that I want you to observe in our text that I want you to be very careful never happens in your life when you feel like life is more than you can handle. Number one, I'll show you these in the Bible. Be careful, because according to verse 4, you can be saved, love Jesus, have the power of God on your life, and lose the desire to even live. It's hard for me to believe a man comes off a mountain that is called fire down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, as I said, licked up all the water, killed 850 false prophets, He's got the power of God on him. Nobody's anointed like Elijah. His name means God is Jehovah. He's born in the worship, anointing, walking with God. He's got fire. He's got boldness. He's not sold out to a camp or a denomination. He's his own man. He's a preaching machine. And the very next chapter, four verses later, this is what he said. Kill me because I have no desire to live. As we get older, we can't take the punishment of life like we did when we were younger. Through the accumulation of problems, it affects us more, and you can't stop it, and neither can I. For instance, when I first started boxing, I've always loved boxing. 
when my brother and I got into Golden Glove boxing. It didn't matter how hard they hit me. They could do body shots, liver punches, solar plexus. They could do my chin. They could even cheat and do a rabbit punch, kidney punch. It didn't bother me. I was young. I was jubilant. I was strong. I could handle all of that. I got into the cage, did K-1 kickboxing. You could kick me in the stomach, in the head. Then I got in the UFC cage fighting, twisting my ears, bleeding all over the place. I broke my hand, bit my tongue, dislocated my knee, bruised two ribs. I went home and my loving, compassionate wife said, I don't want to hear one word out of you. <laughs> but one thing I noticed after spending four nights on the recliner because two of my ribs were broke, one thing I noticed was this. I can't take punches like I did when I was in Golden Glove. It hurts more when somebody hits me. So I'm going back to shooting people because <laughs> that way I'm not sore the next morning. So what I'm saying is because of the accumulation of punches and because of time in my age, I can't take things like I used to. Now see, as our hair turns gray and the longevity of life and problem after problem after problem, as we get older, I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. You can't take the pressure at 55 and 65 that you could take when you were 25. You cannot do that. So what happens is it builds up quicker in us and we find ourselves being short-tempered and we find ourselves getting depressed with the activities of life and it's hard for me to believe that such a man of God would literally pray he not only said it he prayed it God kill me you would not believe how many people sitting in this building today has come to me in the last five years and said I wish God had just let me die and the devil would love nothing more than for you to be robbed of the gift of life God has left you here for a purpose He's promised not to put any more on us than we are able to bear. I can't figure it out. I don't have all the answers, but I know one thing. There's a God in heaven that knows exactly what's going on. He has given me this life, and I want to live it to the fullest of my ability. But when you begin to blow up on inside, you lose your desire to live. Verse number four, watch this. You leave the will of God. Watch verse number four. Here's what he said. He himself went. Never did it say the Lord told him to go. He decided because things wasn't working out, he, he went to Beersheba and he had his young servants with him and he said to them, you guys stay here. And the Bible said he went another day's journey by himself. But it never said God, never, God never told him to go there. See, it's easy that when things are going wrong and you can't figure stuff out and you feel like you've got more pressure on you can handle, it's so easy to start making decisions and going in a direction that God's never approved of. See, you, you just can't change directions because things aren't going right. Or you'll be changing directions the rest of your life. You have got to buckle down and say, this is where God put me, and I'm not going anywhere until God tells me that I need to go to the next step in my life. But until then, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what Jezebel's after me. It doesn't matter how many are after my life. I'm staying where God put me because this is where I belong. More people screw up their Christian lives because they go through something they don't understand and they feel like leaving the church is the answer. Your problems will follow you to any church you go to. You need to stay where God puts you. Problems are not geographical. Problems can go anywhere you want to go. That's why you need to buckle down with the church. Elijah, a good man, meaning what was good, said, I'm going to go this direction on my own. And brother, did he pay for it. You leave, look, look. This is the same philosophy with people with working. You can't get people to work. Are you kidding me? It doesn't matter what pay scale. This crowd is drop dead lazy. I'm telling you, this country has gone nuts. You can't get people to work. I pulled in a little drive through the other day, and I'm not supposed to eat there, but I have a cheat day that I cheat. And uh, usually I go to McDonald's, but my wife has cussed that so much that I believe in the millennial reign, she'll have to eat a Big Mac for a thousand years. So I go to the second best, Crystal's. And you get extra onion and extra pickle. That way you get digestion from the first hamburger on. 
So we go through the drive-thru and we're sitting there. My wife's in the car with me and I told the dude. He took my order on the walkie-talkie thing. He, he met me at the window and then he went and cooked my food. I said, bro, are you running this thing by yourself? He said, I can't get help. He said, I hired three people this morning. Listen to this. He said, I hired three people this morning. They came in, worked two hours, got their first break. I ain't seen them since. They don't even come back and tell you they're quitting. They don't even come back and say, I'm not happy here. They don't even come back to get their money. This crowd's crazy, man. This is what a socialistic, communistic, good-for-nothing, democratic party. <laughs> so here's what they believe. One little thing they don't like, they leave their job. They just leave. I, one thing happened here. I, and I know you've paid my salary for years, and I know you've paid my insurance for years, and I know you've put in my 401K, but you've done one thing I don't like. They leave the job, don't even tell you they leave it. Hey, hey, don't look at me like that. It's the same thing with a marriage. People don't work through problems with their marriage anymore. My God, you can get a divorce paper quicker than you can a roll of toilet paper in Kingsport, Tennessee. And that's saying a lot when snow's on the way. There's no commitment to marriage anymore. Your husband or wife does one thing you don't like, just go down to the courthouse, $99 or whatever they say it is, you can sign the papers and you're divorced. And some of you went through divorce, and I'm not bringing that up to be mean. I'm just telling you, we get a mindset where if everything's just not like we like it, we just leave. Well, that philosophy has dripped into the church. I can win your whole family to God. I can pay your electric bills, help you get a car, get on your feet, put money in your pocket, do everything I can to get you right with God. And one thing happens that you don't like, and without even saying goodbye, they just pack up and leave. You, uh, let me tell you something. We not only have a Christian problem in this nation, we have a character problem. There's a character problem. And some of the people are watching this video now because they can take it in their living room, but they can't take it here on the pew. We got people that leave this church, but they die and go to hell for they'd miss Friday night service at 8 o'clock on television. But you know what? I've invested in these people. I have loved on these people. I have been there every time they've ever needed me and won most of them to Jesus. And they've left here and never even said goodbye or told me they were not coming back. When I call them, they block my number. When I text them, they won't even return. When I see them at Walmart, they run to another aisle. You have got a character problem. There is something bad wrong with somebody that can't look at their pastor and say, God told me to go somewhere else. That's a character problem. And so he decided to leave God's will, lose his desire to live. He limited himself to the vision that, of the blessings that God had given him. Can you imagine being on top of a mountain by yourself and an angel peck on your shoulder? That alone freaked me out. I don't like people touching me, see. And Elijah's laying there depressed, wanting to die, out of the will of God now, right? He left on his own. And God reaches out there and an angel touches him on the shoulder and Elijah sets up, and there's a, the Bible said there's a fire in his camp, and there's bread, there's cake being cooked on it, and there's a cruise of water sitting there by his head. Now, if I woke up out of a dead sleep out in the middle of a desert, and an angel was talking to me and said, Look, brother, I got supper ready for you. It's already done. It's 190 degrees. I got it on low. Said I got some water here. I got ice in it. It's 68 degrees, everything's just right. You talking about a bless? You know how many, how few people in all the Bible were ever fed by an angel? Here's a man being fed by an angel. I mean, God has done good stuff for him. God is the one that gave him the keys to heaven. He walked around with the keys to heaven in his pocket for three and a half years, and it couldn't rain till he said so. But in spite of all of that, he became blind to the blessings of God. You know why I want you to be careful about being wanting to blow up and explode from the inside? No matter how God, good God is to you, you can get to the point where you're blinded to his goodness on your life. I'm glad I was able to get out of bed this morning. I'm glad I still know my name. I'm glad I'll be able to eat afterwards. I'm glad I got a car to get to church in. I'm glad there'll be food on my table. I'm glad there's a bed at my house. I'm glad there's a roof over my head. And I don't want the devil to make me blind to the blessings of God on my life. You limit your vision. Number four, and I got my story. You look for help at the wrong places. You know, Elijah got up and said, I tell you what, God, I'm going to be honest, I'm sick of all this mess because I'm the only one left. 
Of course, God's laughing the whole time at this guy. He said, I'm the only one left. That's why I want you to go ahead and kill me. But I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to look for you again. He said, I'm going to look for you in the wind. The wind is when things are spinning out of control. Elijah said, I, I'm about to explode because things are out of control. The wind blows everything everywhere. There's no direction. He said, but God wasn't in it. He said, then, then, then the earthquake come. Everything under him was shaky. Is there a time when your family, your friends, your finances, and your futures become very shaky? And they said, I tell you what, we'll find God in the earthquake. But God wasn't there. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll find God in the fire that comes off the mountain. Fire is that which devours and destroys. Are you going to go through something in your life where, where seemingly something's destroyed, it's tore down? All you have is the framework left, and you couldn't find God there. But when he got tired of trying to look for God in the wrong places, he stood at the mouth of a cave in a still, small voice. And he said, that's God. I want to be the kind of Christian that when things come my way that I don't like, and I have a lot of things come my way I don't like. I don't want it to make me get discouraged about my life. I don't want me to get blinded to the blessings of God. And I don't want to go to the wrong places to try to get answers to my problem. Look up here at me. Some of you got saved out of beer joints. You are not going to get your answer going back to a bar stool. Some of you got saved with a needle in your arm. You're not going to get saved. You're not going to get answers going back to the dope crowd and the pushers and the whores. Some of you got saved out of immorality. You're not going to find answers at a strip club when all that mess is gone and you find out there's nothing to it. If you'll just stand still, there's a God that'll speak to you out of heaven in a still, small voice that'll set you on fire. So I want to tell you three things quickly. These things are coming. Number one, I want to talk about the protection that's already been prearranged for your situation. The Bible says in verse 9 that uh, Elijah found a cave. A place that had already been carved out before he got to Mount Horeb. I looked it up. Did you know a cave typically is of a natural origin? In other words, people don't dig caves in solid stone. They're usually made that way in their origination. So that means long before Elijah was ever thought of, when God put Mount Sinai on the face of the earth, he said, down the road years from now, I'm going to have a prophet, and he's going to be discouraged, and he's going to be misdirected, and he's going to be misguided. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Long before he's ever thought of, I'm going to put a cave right in the middle of this mountain so that when he comes to that place where he feels like he can't take it anymore, I want him to realize that I was thinking about this long before he was. And I'm going to hide him in a cave. I'm telling you, anything that comes my way, there's a God in heaven that has already lined out a place of protection. He has got a place of safety. He has got a place reserved where we can survive. Thank God in the morning. Let me give you an illustration. Every summer we would go to Mississippi for vacation. And all my mama talked about <coughs> was the tornadoes in Mississippi. Because we didn't have them much up in Ohio. So we'd go to Mississippi. She said, oh, Lord, I hate Mississippi. I'm so glad we left Mississippi. Tornadoes killed my aunt. We found kids up in trees. Cows were found three acres down the road. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, I'm just a little old fella. And I'll never forget, we were staying at Papa's house. He didn't have no, he had no bathroom. He thought the filthiest thing in the world was connecting a bathroom to a house. We had to go out in this little wood building. Oh, brother. You didn't sit on your cell phone out there and see who was texting you, I guarantee you. You got out of there as quick as you could. And I found out what a Sears catalog was really for. And Papa had no air conditioning. He'd sleep with the windows up. Well, I'm from the ghetto, man. You sleep with the window up, you're going to die. Somebody coming in your house, they're going to kill the whole family, rape everybody. You don't sleep with your windows up, you're going to die. Papa, the only thing he shut at night was a screen door. And the only reason why he put the latch on it was to keep the dog from nosing in and getting in the house. I'm laying in a house, nothing but screens, windows, everything's wide open, front door's wide open. Papa left his keys in his car. I thought, man, if you come to the ghetto, we'd rob you in 40 minutes. You'd be broke as Job's turkey. We'd take everything you owned right off of your nose. One night, I laid down, and I felt the wind blowing through that window unusually. 
I was a little boy. I was probably five years old. And I remember it was the middle of the night, and Mama got up with kerosene lanterns and said, there's a storm, there's a tornado coming. And I was a little old fellow. I heard all these gory stories, you know, and I said, man, alive. And she said, but Papa has what they call storm house. How many of you remember the old storm houses? And they'd dig them out of the side of a hill. They were underground so the tornado couldn't get to you. Well, there's no electricity, there's no water, there's no bathroom down there. It's just a hull. But it's better than a tornado, I can tell you that much. So I'm a little five-year-old boy. I'm scared to death. I'm sitting next to my mama. She's sitting there with the kerosene lantern. Some of the neighbors come over. There's probably 20 of us sitting there. And while we were sitting there, my papa looked at me and said, I'm going to tell you the story about this storm house. When your father was dating my daughter, he needed some extra money. And I paid your father back in the 40s to dig this out by hand. Your father built this storm house for safety and protection back in the 40s. I wasn't born until 1959. So in 1965, 20-something years later, I'm sitting in a place of protection that my father had dug out long before I was ever thought of. And I sat there in a place of safety saying if my father built it, I know I'm in a safe place. If my... I'll tell you something. God has a place hewed out in the side of the mountain. And when you go inside that cave, I don't care how much fire, how much smoke, and how much earthquake. If your father carved it out, it'll be a place of protection. You're not going anywhere. God will take care of you when you can't take care of yourself. There is protection. Number two, there's a purpose. God used Elijah's rejection, misunderstandings, and controversy to bring him to a place of self-abandonment, after which God used him even greater than he did before. Did you know Elijah performed 16 miracles during his lifetime? For three and a half years, he carried the keys to heaven. We must be careful. What God is using to build us, don't let us mistake it and let it blow us out instead of build us up. Faith and favor must be exercised in order to grow and get stronger. Can you believe Elijah was fed by a widow, fed by a raven, and fed by an angel? It's never been done before or since. He could bring fire from heaven, multiply food, and even take his mantle and smoke the Jordan River, and the waters parted. He was such a powerful man after he got back with God, he ate one meal, and it lasted 40 days and 40 nights. But here's the one I want to get to, and this is why I don't quit, is the people it affected. He had direct access, access to the king of Israel. He had the attention of all the people of his nation. He was known as the prophet of fire. And what Elijah did not know, and i got to constantly remind myself of this, Brother Andy, when God got a hold of him in that cave, and that still small voice spoke to him, when Elijah stepped out of that cave, you know the first person he ran into? was a young man plowing named Elisha. And Elijah anointed him, and Elisha followed him. And when Elijah went up in the chariot of fire, Elijah said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And God said, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of that man of God that found me. And Elijah, I told you, did 16 miracles. Elijah prayed for a double portion. He did 32 miracles. But it would have never happened had Elijah given up in the cave, had he sat down, had he died, had he quit, had he went in the wrong direction. This would have never happened. I'm going to tell you why I'm not quitting. I'm going to tell you why I'm not leaving. The next person we meet may be the next Elijah that God raises up to preach the Word of God or save by His grace or turn their life around. We can't quit now. There's too many people waiting for help. I'm not a quitter. I didn't get in this thing to quit. I'm not looking for a way to jump out. Let me give you something in closing. I read a story about a young guy that was fired from his newspaper job because he had lack of ideas. They said, you're bland. You have no imagination. You'll never make it in the journalism and newspaper world. So as a young teenage boy, they fired him and laughed at him as he left. He, later on, started his own animation company 
And in 1921, it went bankrupt. He was so hungry and so broke that for a long period of time, he said in his journal, I ate dog food every day to survive. Fired, laughed at, bankrupt, and he said in his journal, long periods of time, I ate dog food just to survive. While eating dog food daily, he tried starting an uh, animation company again. Matter of fact, he tried it several times after that, and every time he only faced greater failure. He's a failure. Find something else you can do. This can't be your gift. Maybe God's got something else for you, planned in a different direction. But he never gave up on his dream. And Walt Disney became the wealthiest animation designer the world has ever known. Because he did not leave his space and he did not quit. In 1889, a man left a long-term good-paying job to begin a never-a-heard-of-before company. He accumulated $150,000 from investors, which is a lot of money back in 1889. And in less than one year, he had lost every bit of that money and it bellied up. In 1901, believe it or not, he was such a smooth talker, he went back and convinced his investors to help him again. They invested another $150,000, but the company went bankrupt in less than a year. Why don't you quit? Your idea is not going to work. Why don't you find something else? Go a different direction. But in 1903, after being considered crazy and a total business failure, he started his company for the sixth time. Five years later, Henry Ford produced the first Model T Ford and the first assembly line production that America has ever known because he stayed in what he believed in and he didn't quit. God give us some people that even if it looks like failure, don't quit. Stay with it. God's got something good right around the corner for you. Don't blow up. Build up. Let it make you stronger. Now watch this. In 1935, Babe Ruth retired, holding the record for the most home runs ever in a major ball series. But what you did not know is in 1935, when he retired, he also held the record for the most strikeouts. Same year. Did you know he went to the dugout twice as many times as he went to first base? But nobody remembers that Babe Ruth is the all-time strikeout artist. When you hear Babe Ruth, you automatically, that's the home run artist. What is it, why, why is there a difference? Because he didn't quit. One time he struck out and he went back to the dugout and his manager said, what do you got to say to that, babe? He said, I'm one strike closer to hitting another home run. But when I feel like I strike out, I'm not throwing the bat. I'm not kicking dirt. I'm not taking my hat off and quitting the game and walking out of the arena. I'm going to go back and tell Jesus, I'm one strike closer to knocking a home run. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to keep doing... Let me give you this, and I'm done. The Bible said he sat under a juniper tree. I want you to notice that. I was reading about a juniper tree. That's what the, they would break the brushes off. That's what they made brooms out of. But they said that the, the reason why the juniper tree was never popular is because the roots are bitter. You can't eat them. They look pretty. They have beautiful yellow flowers that come on them, but they're of absolutely no good because down in the roots, they're bitter. That's why Paul said in the book of Hebrews, the root of bitterness springing up will defile many. In other words, your bitterness will influence other people to be bitter just like you. I don't hang around bitter people. I don't associate with bitter people. I don't make my friends around bitter people. And the reason why some people never get over this and they never get back and they never get back under the blessing of God is because down underneath in the roots where nobody knows it, you're bitter at somebody about something. And it will keep you under a juniper tree and out of the blessings of God for the rest of your life. i tell you what I want to do. I want to submit myself to Him. I want to go where He tells me to go. I want to stay where He tells me to stay. And I'm going to listen for that still, small voice because I know He'll protect me under the shadow of His wings. Let's give Him a hand. Thank you, Lord.